Well, hello there. So let's do some phasor circuit problems. Uh, see some examples is a good way to learn this. So I encourage you to try these yourself and especially to put all the numbers into your calculator to verify that you get the same solutions because doing the math part is uh, the trickier part. The circuits hopefully is just a review of the kind of circuit analysis we've done before using resistors. So remember, this is our process. We, we put everything in cosine format. Then we write down the impedances of all the components. So resistors, inductors, capacitors, all will be treated the same as impedances. That lets us write everything as a phasor and do the circuit analysis in the phasor domain. Then once we find whatever we're after, we have to transform it back into the time domain. So here's the first problem. This is a node analysis problem where we're trying to find V1 in this circuit with a resistor, inductor, and a capacitor. We've got two sources, and we've already been transformed into the phasor domain. So here we would put a ground node. You look at all the other nodes. We've got this VA node is known with the voltage source connected to ground. This node has to be 20 with a phase of 90. Same thing over here. We've got a voltage source. So this node is known. And so the only unknown node voltage is V1 here. So for each unknown node, we write the Kirchhoff's current law. Here we're going to do the, all the currents going out. So IR, IC, and IL up here have to sum to zero. Then we use Ohm's law, but now with impedances. So it's always the tail of the arrow, the voltage at the tail of the arrow, minus the voltage at the head of the arrow, divided by the impedance in between. So IR, so for all of these, the tail of the arrow is V1. So they're all V1 minus something. So IR is V1 minus VA divided by the resistance. IC is V1 minus VB divided by the impedance of the capacitor. And uh, the current through the inductor IL is V1 minus zero because it's connected to ground divided by the impedance of the inductor. So put these in. Be careful with the signs, the plus and minus signs as you go along with your calculator. But that's this is the setup. We combine Kirchhoff's current law and Ohm's law together, we get this equation and we have one equation and one unknown that we can solve for V1. So if we collect the terms and solve for it, here I've solved it in MATLAB. So I, I wrote it out 20J over 5 plus 10 divided by 10J divided by this quantity here, 1 fifth minus 1 over 10J plus 1 over 20j, and we get the answer here as the rectangular form. You have to really be careful with these in your calculator, especially things like the 10j and the denominator, because depending on how you write it, you can easily make mistakes from the order of operations. It's a very common mistake that I see. So here, it, uh, putting parentheses is always the right thing to do. So 1 over 10j with parentheses can't go wrong. This is correct. This is the mistake that people make, 1 over 10j, but there it's dividing by 10 and then multiplying by j in the, in the numerator. So we have a, the opposite sign because if you move j from the numerator to the denominator, it flips the sign. But just to be confusing, if you write 10j without the multiply, without this star, then MATLAB recognizes this as a single thing. It's a complex number, and so it's dividing by the whole number, 10j, not dividing by 10 and then multiplying by the number j. So be careful because it's easy to make mistakes. Both this one and this one will give you the right answer, but any time you're not sure, put parentheses in to group things as you like. So practice the math. Make sure you can get the numbers as well as understand the algebra. Okay, so this problem is another node analysis problem. We're trying to find the current here. 
but we're generally trying to do node analysis for this circuit. This one is from the book and it uses a lot of shortcuts that I'll try to explain as we go along in order to minimize the number of equations when we have things in series like this the book doesn't choose to put an unknown at this node in general you could and there's no problem and Kirchhoff's current law at this node here in between two things in series is really simple so it doesn't hurt to do it that way and that's the way I've always done it is just a little more math but the same thing every time but you'll see the book chooses for its unknown nodes only the uh, extraordinary nodes they're called in the book where they're not things in series so we'll have voltages here and here and here this voltage source in the middle would be treated as a super node in in a lot of cases because we the voltage here and the voltage here neither of them are ground and there's an unknown current going through here, but we'll see the book actually takes a little bit of a shortcut and combines, again, these into, um, because they're in series, it can take advantage of that fact. So I'll, I'll talk about that as we go. But the, um, the first step is to find all the impedances, convert everything to the phasor domain. So we've got Vs1 is 12 cosine 10 to the third T, so that's our omega, 10 to the 3. This is V, and Vs2 is a sine function, so we need to get a phase of minus 90 when we convert that to cosine, which gives us negative 6J for Vs2. And Vs1 is 12 plus 0J, so this is a complex number. It's not DC 12 volts. It can be confusing the way the book shows these sometimes. This is what I'm talking about. This looks like a 12 volt DC source, but this is a sine wave. This is a phasor, so it's 12 plus 0J. Over here, we've got negative 6J because of the negative 90 phase. It's going up and down, coming down. And so now we're going to go and label all of the voltages. So we have V1 here, V2 here, V3 here, ground node at the bottom. And you can see the book is taking some shortcuts and skipping. You could put a node here and you could solve for this node voltage. You could put a node here and solve for this node voltage. This one is known to be Vs2, so we wouldn't solve for that one. And then right here, that's another unknown voltage that you would need to use a super node kind of approach to solve for that one. So the book is shortcutting anything in series, not adding an extra unknown, although you certainly could. So if you like that, try, try solving it that way and you should get the same numbers at the end. So let's see how this one goes. So here they're going to do node 1 first, and it's pretty straightforward. I1, I2, and I3 have to sum to 0. Kirchhoff's current law. And I1, it's always the tail of the arrow. So V1 minus V3 divided by R3. And I3, well, these two are both sort of shortcut ones. So here there's a node up at the top to explain this. We've got V2 on this side of the 12 volt source and this node voltage has to be 12 volts lower because to go from the minus to the plus we bump up 12 volts. So this node voltage right there is V2 minus 12. So they just use that and it's, it's basically the same thing as the super node auxiliary equation but they're not using the super node here because these are in series. So if you take that as V2 minus 12, then when we do I2, it's V1 minus the quantity V2 minus 12 divided by R2. So this is I2, and that's where this comes from here. They just expanded the parentheses. I3, similarly, we could do V1 minus this node divided by 3, this node voltage divided by 3, but they skip all the way to the bottom and do V1 minus 0 divided by 3 plus Zc, which is negative 4j. So V1 minus 0 over the total impedance of these two things in series. So the book is taking this shortcut approach to minimize the number of unknowns. If you, if you treat every ordinary node as an unknown, you'll have a lot more 
a lot bigger matrix to solve, but that's okay. So that's how we get the first node equation, Kirchhoff's current law, Ohm's law with a few tricks. And this is our equation for our matrix. Node 2 over here is very similar. We have I6 is simple V2 minus V3 divided by R5. Here, I5, V2, again they're doing the trick all the way down, V2 minus 0 divided by the total impedance, 2 plus 1J, V2 minus 0 over 2 plus 1J. I4 is going this way, so it's the negative of I2 that we had in the last equation. So we get this here for I4. So I4 plus I5 plus I6 has to equal 0, and we can do the math. Then node 3 over here, we have I8 going out, I7 going out, and I9 going out. I8 is simple V3 minus V1 divided by R3 here. I7, V3 minus V2 divided by R5, I7. So I9, we know this is Vs2 here. So V3 minus negative 6J divided by R6. Get this here. So that one's the easiest one of all, I think. And that's our third equation. Put them in matrix form and give them to MATLAB, and you'll solve for the voltages. And then if you need IL, it's the same as I5, which we should have right here. So we can solve for that. IL, and we finally get complex number for IL, and then we can find its amplitude in phase and put it in polar form, and then it's easy to go back to the time domain. So that's node analysis using some of the tricks that the book likes to use for node analysis. You could have solved this without using those tricks, but it would take more unknowns. You put a voltage here, voltage here, and a super node around this thing and a voltage there. So you would have a six by six system with a super node, or this is a three by three system using their tricks for things in series. So mesh analysis works exactly the same way with impedances as it did with resistors. Of course, the, the numbers are complex numbers. So this is an example of using mesh analysis by inspection, which is another fast way to do mesh analysis we didn't really cover it, it's in the book, so I'm just going to put it here and say if you want to try mesh analysis, check your answers against this one. It should work just fine. Um, there's really no difference between the solution process, it's all in the complex number analysis. So if you want to do mesh analysis by inspection, it's, it's, it's in the book, you could read it. Um, I think just using the basic mesh analysis, only learning one technique, is probably plenty for this class. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but, but be aware that it works just fine. Okay, so something that we will spend some time on because it's going to keep coming up. Uh, Thevenin equivalent circuits. Remember, Thevenin is where you replace any circuit with two terminals coming out of it with a voltage source and originally a resistor, but now an impedance. So Thevenin process works exactly the same with phasers. It's a two-step process. You have to find ZT, the Thevenin impedance, before we found a Thevenin resistance, which is by zeroing all the sources and finding the equivalent impedance. And then the second step, find the Thevenin voltage, which is the open circuit voltage across the terminals with the load removed, normally done with a node analysis. So once we find those two things, we redraw, we redraw a Thevenin circuit and we label the voltage and the Thevenin impedance and that is our final solution. So you're not done until you draw this picture and write down the two numbers. Here's an example for the Thevenin. So we want to find the Thevenin equivalent of this circuit here. We've got a resistor and a capacitor 
a voltage source and a current source. And they're all already converted to the phasor domain. So the first step is to find the Thevenin impedance. So we zero the sources. So the current source becomes zero amps by cutting it out. No current can flow, zero amps there if we, if we open circuit it. And this, the voltage becomes zero volts by short circuiting it because in a wire there's zero voltage drop across this short circuit. And then we find the equivalent impedance from A to B. So we're an electron going this way and we combine things in series and in parallel until we get back to B. So here you can see that this is in parallel with that because it's, their heads are connected together at node A and their tails are both connected to node B. They're not geometrically parallel, but they are electrically in parallel here. So we combine using the one over the one overs. So the equivalent impedance is one over one over ZR plus one over ZC which is 1 over 100 ohms plus 1 over negative 100 J. And remember, when you have a J in the denominator, you can put the J in the numerator if you flip the sign from plus to minus, because if you multiply the top and the bottom by J over J, you get a J in the top and you get a J squared in the bottom, and J squared is negative 1. So that can be written like this. But you could just put it in your calculator and find the final answer like this. So this is in polar form, if you like, or in rectangular form. If we convert this to polar form, it's easy to do the division because one the, the amplitude is 1 over the amplitude. So 1 over 0.0414 gives us the 70.7. And this is 1 with a phase of 0, so 0 minus 45, the numerator phase minus the denominator phase gives us minus 45. So you can go back to module 8 if you're confused on how this division works. But you could also just put this in your calculator and do it all in rectangular form if you'd rather. There's a really common mistake people do because we're used to capacitors being different from inductors and resistors. So when we did capacitors with the differential equations, Resistors and inductors, when they're in series, they add. When they're in parallel, it's the one over the one overs. And capacitors were the opposite. Capacitors in parallel add, and capacitors in series are the one over the one overs. This is not the case for impedances. Everything, including capacitors, combine like resistors. So be careful if it's the impedance of a capacitor. It's just an impedance. So if it's in series, you add. If it's in parallel, you one over the one overs resistors, capacitors, inductors, all exactly the same way. So don't do the capacitors differently when you're doing phasor math. We've seen this a lot already, but it's worth pointing out because it's a common mistake. So that was half of the Thevenin. Felt like we did a lot there, but we just found the Thevenin impedance. Now we have to find the Thevenin voltage. So we do node analysis, and normally you put the ground node at B, and you try to find the voltage at A. That's our open circuit voltage from A to B. That's what we need. So here we have a node. This is the same node, so one big node up here. Another node over here, but that's known because of the voltage source, so that's the VS node. So there's only one unknown voltage to solve for. And so we do Kirchhoff's current law. So the current going out, IR plus IC plus IS, equals zero. This branch goes towards the terminal A, and since it's an open circuit voltage, there's no current flowing there. So these three have to sum to zero. Then we do Ohm's law with impedances. So IC is VT minus zero over the impedance of the capacitor. IR, VT minus VS over ZR. And IS is from the current source. So if we combine them together, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's current law, we get this equation here. And then we're solving for VT. So factor out the VT terms and divide. Just if you leave it all in terms of impedances and sources, it looks exactly the same as if they were a resistor circuit. And then you can go ahead and put all the complex numbers in at the end if you like. 
or you can do it along the way if you like. But eventually you should get to this number for Vt, 100 with a phase of minus 90. Yay! So we're basically done. We can put it back in polar form or we can leave it in rectangular form. These are equivalent phasers, so I don't care which form you put. Um, but this is the phaser of the Thevenin equivalent, and since we started with a phasor circuit, we can end it here. If you went all the way back to the time domain, this polar form is very easy to put into a cosine, and Z in general, the Thevenin impedance, is a complex number, so that's not a single component, but you can make the real part from resistors and the imaginary part from capacitors or inductors, and you'll see that in the homework. This has a phase of minus 45, so using a capacitor and a resistor in series would be an easy way to do it. If this was a positive phase, then a capacitor and an inductor in series would be easy to do. We can't solve this one any farther because we don't have the omega frequency to convert. Okay, well, I hope you understand the basics here of circuit analysis using phaser is the same as we've been doing with circuit analysis and resistor circuits so you should have good skills to keep doing that and do test your answers go all the way through the numbers don't just set up the equations because there are a lot of tricks to getting the complex number solutions correctly so you'll want to practice that for sure all right i will see you in the next video and let me know if you have any questions